Well, I want to just welcome you if you're guests this morning. Welcome. So glad that you're here. Those of you that may not have been here in a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago we removed 1,397 coffee stains in one afternoon by tearing the carpet out of here. And we've been working with it the last couple Sundays. And we promise your feet will only stick to the floor for a couple more weeks. And then uh, it'll all be gone because you'll have taken the glue home with you on your shoes. I'm just kidding. People have asked, they've said, uh, what is the plan? And uh, my answer is, this is the plan. At this point, there's nothing further. This is the plan. Uh, just because, I don't know about you, but I'm convinced that even remnants of carpet glue look better than 1,397 coffee stains because some of those coffee stains were 14 years ago and uh, they still existed today. Justin, he, he did it. He's, he spilled one of them. Anyway, um, uh, but uh, we're looking into some different things, rubber flooring, carpet squares, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but a group is coming in here this afternoon, I think, or tomorrow with uh, a chemical called xylene. We couldn't do it this last week because uh, we had one wild night here and we didn't want anybody to go to the hospital with chemical burns to their face, right? Yeah, so, so it's happening this week and uh, we'll have it all fumigated uh, and aired out for next weekend. But your feet hopefully won't stick quite as badly. Take your shoes home with you, though. We, we really don't, you know, take them home with you. We'll get you a chisel. You can get them off the floor and you can get them out of here. And, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So how many love seeing your church move forward in different directions, different things? It's, it's a really important thing, I think, to always feel like uh, the, the, the church is moving forward. Amen. And Well, I got to tell you, this message that I'm about to share from you, uh, uh, it, it actually came to me yesterday morning. I was uh, yesterday morning in a really, really cold high school gymnasium. I used to play a lot of Saturday morning basketball back in the day, and I forgot how cold high school gymnasiums are at 7.30 in the morning on a Saturday, especially with the threat of snow looming. And so my, my little girl, my daughter Seven, she's a gymnast, and she had her second meet of the fall season, and so we were down there supporting our, uh, our level three handstand walking back handspring layout tuck flipping kid. We were, we were supporting her, and as I was watching her, the, the Lord started to, started, to, started to speak a few things to me through my daughter that, that actually crafted the content of what I'm going to share with you. So uh, I scrapped what I had been working on this last week, and I just went with this and uh, literally started writing it in the car on the way here uh, last night on the way home. Uh, I just, when God speaks to me like that, I just kind of sit on it for a little bit, and then I just start, bleh. And when the bleh gets done, we get the chunks out, and it's all good. So anyway, sorry, that was, since I said bleh, I had to run with it. I was stuck. Um, but one of the things that I did not anticipate when my daughter started becoming a gymnast is I did not understand the commitment level or the work required in gymnastics. Any former gymnasts in here, you grew up doing gymnastics and any soon-to-be Olympians or anything like that? Yeah. The, the, the work is unbelievable. People ask us all the time, so when is the gymnastics season? Well, let me tell you when it is. It started when we enrolled her in gymnastics at four and we're still not done with the first season. It's just, we're five years, it never stops. It's year round. One of the times Seven was getting a little burned out. She had some overuse injuries, like when she was eight years old in her foot and that. And so we just felt like it would be good to rest her for like 30 days, which for Seven is kind of like being in purgatory for 30 days, not being able to do what she loves to do. And, and, um, and uh, the problem was I realized like the downside of that is when we put her back in, her conditioning suffered so much that it took her like two months just to get back to the level of where she was before we pulled her out to rest something she really didn't need rest from. And so it is just a massive, massive commitment. And so on the days of the competitions, there's always a radical amount of distractions that are happening to her. Just like in life, right? We have a lot of things that happen to us in life. Like yesterday, it was the first time 
seven move gyms from last year to this year just because of some just personal decisions in our family and that was the first time that she had to face off and compete against her old teammates so the first thing she does when she sees me she runs up and she says dad dad my old gym's here my old gym's here and i'm like seth i want you to take courage even though your old gym's here see i use the word courage and joy with seven because in seven's journey as a gymnast they do some stuff that can create some fear Anybody, everybody in here know what it means to fear? Well, here's what fear, the emotional response in your life and my life and my daughter's life to fear is anxiety. My worldview, when I live from a posture of fear and the emotion of anxiety is, my worldview is I'm frightened that it's only going to go wrong. And so... We, we try to counterbalance in Seven's life because she has to do these big moves that are scary. We try to counterbalance that with a different word. I take courage to do the work. So I encourage her all the time. Seven, be courageous to do the work to be the gymnast that you want to be. Be courageous because courage has a different atmosphere to it. Courage releases within us this perspective of not being frightened like fear, but it releases a perspective of affirmation with us. We begin to emotionally feel affirmed when we take courage. And then our worldview becomes, when we feel confident and affirmed, guess what our worldview becomes? It is possible. So even in the midst of of what could make you anxious, when you take courage, that word affects you differently in how you look at what's in front of you or what's happening to you. When you're operating from, I've, a lot, how many use fear as a motivator? Some of you will say, I fear being average and that motivates me to be great. I would submit, have the courage to be great instead of fearing to be average. And I'll tell you why. Because fear produces anxiety, but courage produces what is possible. You know what's possible when you focus on courage? If your goal is to be, it's possible to be great. So I've worked so hard with seven in that. So when she comes up to me, my coach is telling me, da, 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 and she's got all these routines to know and all these little things. I'm like, it's a lot for this head of a nine-year-old kid. Like, I don't know how she does it, but she loves it, so she does it. So when she gets afraid, I tell her to take courage. I'm like, take courage, Seven, in the work. And take joy in the process. Because joy affects our life in so many ways. And so what am I doing when I do that? I'm, I'm working on what's happening in Seven's mind. I'm working on her thinking. Do you know that studies suggest that we think 30,000 thoughts a day about ourselves? We think about ourselves a lot. To us, we are a really big deal, right? We just, we think about ourselves a lot, and, and it always causes me to think when I say that, what are your dominant thoughts about you? What do you think about you? Do you think of yourself as a success? Do you think in terms of courage of what is possible? Do you think in terms of joy as what is complete? Did you know the worldview of somebody in joy is completeness? That's why God said, that's why he said, that's why he speaks so heavily to the joy factor in our life 
because he knows if he can put you into joy, he can put you into a worldview, a mindset of completeness, of wholeness. Or are the dominant thoughts, if we're being honest with ourselves, or are our dominant thoughts less than what they should be? Do we think of ourselves as average? Our 30,000 thoughts a day is a lot of thoughts to be thinking. There's an old quote out there, you are and you become what you think about most. And so if you want to become something, you can't become it until you start thinking it. So if our thoughts are, I'm ugly, I'm less than, I'm not talented enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not made that way, I can't, I won't, my parents didn't, my family hasn't. If my thoughts, 30,000 thoughts a day, if my dominant thoughts have me here, then I can't get there and release the fullness of who I am. Proverbs says what? In Proverbs chapter 27, 23, verse 7, it says, For as a man, as he thinks in his heart, so shall he be. As you think about you, so will you be. So when I start thinking about thoughts that dominate the human nature, and I hear somebody's self-talk is always shameful and regretful and guilty and angry, that you want to know what's a pro what the problem is with our social media dialect that's happening? It reveals what we're thinking as a nation and as a people. Most of us are angry because the worldview of somebody who's struggling with anger is being an antagonist. The reason people poke you on social media and then poke everybody else and get them going is because everybody's mad. The emotion of anger is hate. Now, I come from a different generation. I come from the generation of the Xers. Any Xers in here? And by the way, that wasn't a term of endearment growing up. I didn't like being X'd out. But now it's like X, Y, Z, double A to the B. I, it's just, it's turning into a bad 80s rap is what it's turning into. So I'm okay with it now. But listen. You barely heard the word hate in 88. See what I did there? You, you didn't talk about hating groups of people or hating this or hating that in 1986 and 85 and 84 because our society was so mad. Now, I don't know what we were. But society today is mad. They're angry, so that comes out in the form of hate, so everybody's antagonizing everybody all the time. Because that's what's in their head. The dominant thoughts of our lives are, can be different. Because the truth is, is that God speaks a lot to this. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing what? Come on, everybody together. The way you, come on, one more time. The way you, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I get it. A financial situation might be happening 
to you. The outlook may be dire, but what you end up thinking about what happens to you determines the outcome of what happens more than we most often give credit for. A, a struggle in a family situation may be happening to you. The circumstances may be negative, may be negative, but our thoughts of what's happening in us doesn't have to match what's happening to us. Could be a work situation. Could be a relationship. The reality is, is we are the doorkeepers of that which comes in to our thinking, to our mind, to our processes, to our self-talk. If we're talking to ourselves 30,000 words a day, then we should have a say on what that conversation is. So the question you got to ask yourself, is your day going to shape your thoughts or is your thoughts or are your thoughts going to shape your day? Because that, my friends, is a really important question. Because most people just live getting up in the morning hoping that it's going to be a good day until something happens to them and then they decide in that minute if today's going to be a good day or if it's going to be a not so good day and that shapes what they think. Well, I want you to know something. In this fallen, broken culture that we live in where everything that's bad's becoming good and everything that's good's becoming vile and everything that was wrong is right and right is wrong and nobody knows what's coming or going I want you to know something if you're shaping your 30,000 thoughts by what's happening to you I promise you you are not keeping the door of what's happening in you and there's things happening in you that God didn't design for you Don't copy that. So there's this guy, seven minutes, good Lord, that intro took too long. There's this guy, I'll be fast, is that fair? Is fast fair? There's this guy, his name's Joshua, how many have heard of him? It's an amazing story. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Do you think that Joshua knew already that Moses was dead? He was Moses' assistant. What is God saying to you? He's acknowledging what happens to you. He acknowledges the financial situation. He acknowledges the breakup. He acknowledges this. He acknowledges that. He acknowledges what you're going through. He shows us. He says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. I acknowledge that, Joshua. I know how much of a loss that is to you. Don't forget, Joshua and Caleb were the only ones of Moses' tribe and generation to cross into the next level because they were the ones of faith. Moses had the faith. Joshua had the faith. Caleb had the faith. Nobody else had the faith. Joseph was the only one left. So do you think that that was a big personal loss to Joshua, Moses dying? God is saying, I know what personally you have lost. I know the burden I'm about to lay upon you. Do you think Joshua was, was familiar with the burden that Moses carried as a leader? Well, he was his assistant. How many know leading anything is difficult? Leading your kids through Disneyland, the most wonderful place on earth, is difficult when you're the leader. I remember as a kid, I didn't think much of it. This is the greatest place on earth. I had no idea there was danger at every turn until I became the leader of a tribe of kids going through Disneyland. There are real pitfalls out there. So God's acknowledging to Joshua, I understand your loss and I understand your burden. God understands your loss, my friend. He understands your burden. And this is what he says. Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time's come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan into a land I'm giving them. 
he goes on. He says, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot will be on land I have given you. And he lays out the boundaries through verse 4. Verse 5, he says, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. That's pretty amazing right there. I'll not fail you or abandon you. I'll not fail you or abandon you. God, in this passage, gives Joshua something very powerful. He gives a direct word to him. Do you believe that God can speak to you in the midst of what's happening to you? There's a prophetic word into Joshua. What's happening to him is massive loss and massive burden. And God speaks prophetically right into it. I'm not going to abandon you, and I'm not going to fail you. And then he goes on. Be strong and courageous. Hear that word right there? You think think Joshua had fear? Of course he did. We all have fear. We all have fear. We don't use fear. We use courage. Courage is the antidote of fear. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors. I will give them. Be strong and very courageous, God says. Be careful, he says, to obey the instructions Moses gave you. So God talks about the prophetic revelation. I'm with you as I was with Moses. You're not going to be abandoned. This is the prophetic rhema word in the moment of the loss and the burden. God speaks to your situation. But then he says, be careful to obey the instructions Moses gave in your life. God's saying not only have you been given the prophetic revelation to get through this, but you've been given the revelation of Moses, your teacher, your pastor, your mentor, your friend, to get through this. Don't deviate from them. Turn to the left or the right. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Verse 8, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Not just the prophetic revelation, not just God speaking to it, not just the mentorship, the pastor, the speaker speaking into Joshua, what he's been taught his whole life by his pastor Moses, but also the written word, the Bible, cover to cover, been given. He says, observe everything written in it. Only then you'll prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you Wherever you go, do you realize that courage, the courage to be in the midst of what's happening to us, the courage to be what God speaks in our heart, it yields an incredible amount of affirmation. Courage will cause you to know beyond knowing that you've heard the Lord. Courage causes you to believe that you can. Courage starts to reveal to you those people who also believe that you can. As long as you're in fear, you'll find everybody that's anxious. But when you step into courage, you'll find everybody that, who will affirm you that's also on the same path of courage. Because those with courage in their thinking don't hang with people who are in fear. Because the people of courage know that fear is just one thought away. It's just one fork in the road so if you want to get around people that aren't anxious get it lose the fear take on courage see these are the little things I tell my daughter before she flips and twists not quite like that but see what we start thinking about starts impacting us you can meditate on a news report or you can meditate on God's report you 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 can You can think about a lot of stuff, but you control the doorway to your mind. So the whole problem is choosing what to focus on. David said it this way. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. David, by chance, was speaking over his nation. 
And he was basically saying, some trust in their army, some trust in their mighty soldiers, but this nation, Israel, trusts in the Lord. That's what he was speaking over. You need to decide, what am I trusting in, in this house, in this house, between your ears? Albert Einstein said it this way. He said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We have to open up. We have to close the door to things and open the door to things. The economy is not your source to fix the financial what's happening to you. God is the source to fix the financial, right? Right. And respectfully, guys, government is not going to fix the issues in our society, amen? The Lord is going to fix the issues in our society. But it has to first begin with what we're meditating on. Do you know why Facebook is such a platform for some dude to sell some product to you for 50 bucks a month where he tells you to how to go find purpose in life? It's, you know why it works? Because most people don't believe there's a purpose for their life. Because they haven't ever opened, closed the door to just everything that's constantly coming at them. You are the gatekeeper. And as you think, so you will become. Here was the thought that I had yesterday morning. You become what you believe. If you believe you'll never find Mr. Right, unfortunately, and I hate it for you, but you will probably never find Mr. Right. Or Mrs. Wright. You become what you believe. That's what God's saying right here. If you believe you'll never be successful, you're probably right. Yet, if you believe that there's a great story being worked out, no matter what happens to you, guess what? There'll be a great story that's worked out studies the facts the science guys shame feeling a bunch of shame just leads to humiliation it becomes a worldview that's miserable you met anybody miserable lately there's a lot of shame in their thinking their 30,000 thoughts are spent thinking about how they're not good enough and that's why they're miserable take courage Take courage. Have you ever met anybody with a lot of fear? We talked about it a little bit. It, all it does is create anxiety. All it does is create frightening. And there's only one day a year you can be frightened, and that's last Tuesday on Halloween. I already spoke about that last week in my sensitive spirit. You know, the other side to all that is courage yields affirmation. Life becomes about what is possible when we feel affirmed. When we know God has got us, when we know there are others that are on the pathway of courage with us, and when we know that, that, that God's spoken to us and we take courage to that, man, we wake up every morning not for what happens to us, but we wake to happen to something because we wake up every morning with, man, something is possible today. Joy brings peace. Life becomes complete. That's why God said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joshua, be strong and courageous. The joy, of the, the joy, the joy in the process, the courage to do the work. These are the ingredients that move our needle in our life. These are the things that push it forward. Remember, remember Paul says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what's true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I'll end right here. To you, this is big. Some of you really need to listen to this because it's going to change how you think. To you, God becomes who you believe him to be. Some of you, some of you don't always believe God to be who he really is.
if you believe that God if you believe he's indifferent then your view of him will just be that he's demanding and so every time somebody mentions anything to God you'll just be like oh what's he want from me now all he does is demand things from me. That's why sometimes like giving messages are so tough for people to hear because their view of God, their belief about him is that he's indifferent towards you, that somewhere in your life you went through something and you just thought he didn't care. Something happened to you and it changed the way you thought about him. And the way you're thinking about him is producing in you a way of belief. Be transformed, the Lord says, by the renewing of your mind. Some people think of God as a denier. I ask him, I prayed. I went through that situation when I was a kid. Oftentimes, people most adverse to God are people most affected by a story of seeking Him that didn't turn out the way that they wanted it to. And so they see Him as a denier. And because He's a denier in their mind, they live with this perspective that they're just always disappointed in him. So why even try? The problem with that perspective is is that you can never take away the desire and the craving that you have. That man, if God could just somehow impact my life. Ah, but he's a denier. It's such a war. I had a friend for years, went to church here, hasn't went to church here in years. He was the kind of guy that just didn't see God through the right lens. And he tried so hard. We'd meet and talk and do devotions together and all these things. And he just, gosh, he was just always spun up and spun out. Anybody ever met anybody like that? He called me a while ago after years of not hearing from him. And he said, Jeff, I'm calling you. I'm like, why are you calling me? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm just calling to connect with you because I want to talk about that season. He said, I lost my faith. I lost my friends. I lost my church. I lost my marriage. I lost my kids. I lost my home, I lost my job, <laughs> I've lost everything. And he said, I finally, I, I went, I got some counseling. And I realized in counseling that it wasn't God or my friends or you or my wife or my employer or the mortgage company, <laughs> it was me. I just never saw God as anybody but a taker. So I just figured that everybody always was taking from me and never giving to me. And it cost me everything. And he said, I just want you to know, I'm just sorry. Because I was really bad to you. Because I blamed you. Because you weren't enough. I'm just really sorry. What a story. If he could have just replaced seeing God as a denier, to seeing God as merciful, at just the very least, it's a God of mercy. At least a God of mercy we could get along with. But a denier, why would we ever want to open up to him? I mean, at least we could change in this room this morning to see him in as a merciful God. 
because he becomes what we believe him to become. Because I believe him as a merciful God and I've experienced that. But my experience can't change your mind. You are the keeper of your mind. And he is a merciful God. Or what if we just started to see him as he is, as a God of love? Well, guess what? Then we find him, our relationship to him, as one of reverence. Do you know that we revere that which we love? I can prove it to you. How many guys here, like, have a favorite toy? Maybe it's a golf club. Maybe it's a 69 Camaro. Maybe it's a hunting rifle. Maybe it, a favorite toy. Favorite toy? Favorite toy. How many guys have something that you just love? When's the last time that thing sat outside in the rain? You revere it. Ladies, y'all have something that you love. You will not give it to the kids. You revere it. Do you know that everything that you revere, revelation comes out of it? When you revere God, because he's the God of love, he'll begin to reveal himself to you. When you just seek he's a denier and you're indifferent to him, you'll get what you believe. But if you begin to just say in the midst of where I'm at tonight, Jeff, where I'm at right now in this moment, I just am going to think he's a God of love. All of a sudden it just changes our response to him. And we begin to revere him. I went way over my time. Make a decision this morning to fix your thoughts. You can't control what happens to you any more than my little girl could control the distractions that were happening all around her at her gymnastics meet. But you control the door to your one and only mind. You control that door. Man, make a decision to say, I'm only going to believe what God says about me. I'm going to stop believing about what they said, or they said, or they said, or they said. I'm just going to stand right here in this position. And I know that you've been going through stuff that happens to you. But when what happens in you is God, what happens to you has to submit to that space. So Father, in Jesus' name, in fact, just stand right where you're at. Ephesians tells us to let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. To let the Holy Spirit renew our thoughts and attitudes. You know my best adjective for the Holy Spirit? He's our companion. He does life with us. He reveals the truth to us. He points us continuously toward His, toward the Father and toward the Son. And to transform our minds and our thoughts, them 30,000 thoughts we're thinking. We need his influence in our life. So just however you do it, maybe you lift your hands to God. May you bow your head to God. Whatever you do. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our thinking, into our lives. Lord, speak to us this week, God, even today, God to take captive those thoughts that lift themselves above what God says. Lord, help us recognize to close the door to that report, those statements, these influences. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will rule and reign our mind. Be strong, my friend. Take courage, my friend. The Lord sees the loss. He sees the burden. 
And as he's been with others, so he will be with you. I hear the Lord saying for you, he will not leave you nor forsake you in this time. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father.